All right, so it's three o'clock. So we're going to start now. Um, so welcome everyone who's here so far to our third workshop and our Creating the Eco Living Kitchen series. Um, it's a growing your own food workshop. And uh, so next slide. So this is the overview of the workshop. So we're just gonna do a quick introduction of the team. And then we're gonna talk about indoor gardening and foraging. And then we'll take a little bit of a break and then we'll go to outdoor gardening with our guest speaker, Dave Rempel from the uh, David Douglas Botan Botanical Society. And then we'll have a bit of a, a wind down where we'll, you can ask some questions and we can kind of go everything over everything. And we'll also have uh, a prize draw at the end. Next slide. So first we wanna do, a territorial acknowledgement. Um, so we want to recognize that um, me, Anne, and Shauna are on the traditional terry of the Clayley Tanay, and we are very grateful to be able to live, work, go to school, and um, host these workshops on their land. Um, so to kind of introduce ourselves as a team, we are Alec or Eco Living Kitchen. Um, and it's a Prince George initiative funded by the Fraser Basin Council's co-creating a sustainable BC project. Um, the Elk Initiative is the Northern BC cohort's attempt to address kitchen, kitchen waste, both organic and inorganic in the North. This is the first, or this is the third, sorry, in a series of workshops that will give people the skills to reduce waste in their own kitchens. So now we're gonna have the Elk team uh, introduce yourself. So I'll start with myself. I'm Hannah. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I have, I joined this initiative and this team because I really like um, being hands-on and kind of doing actual work in the community that I live in and take the things that I'm learning and put them into real situations. Um, and then next we'll uh, go to Anne. Hello everyone, my name is Anne. Um, I go to UNBC. Uh, my pronouns is she and her, and um, I'm really grateful to be surrounded by such amazing um, teammates like Shauna and Hannah who are so passionate about the environment. And that's sort of the reason why I joined this initiative is to meet people who are as passionate as I am about sustainability. Thank you, and I'll go over to Shauna. Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Shauna. Um, my pronouns are she and her. I'm also an undergraduate student at UNBC and I am joined this initiative because similar to Anne, I really want to meet like-minded people in our community. I know there's a lot of passionate people here in Prince George who care about the environment and want to be taking action on climate change or getting more involved in sustainability. And I wanted to get more involved in that myself. Um, also just to let you know, uh, we do have a fourth team member as well, Helga. Uh, they could not join us today, but uh, they are here in spirit. And so, yeah, thanks for joining us. And I'll pass it back to Hannah. Thank you, Anna and Chana. And like Chana mentioned in the chat, you guys can introduce yourselves in the chat and the land, of the indigenous land or territory that you're currently residing, if you'd like. Because um, we'd love to get to know who's attending our workshops and kind of build a community. And the last uh, part we want to touch on in the introduction is talking about our workshop structure. Uh, these workshops are a space for knowledge sharing. While the ELK team will facilitate the workshop, we are by no means experts. Uh, we hope to create an online space where everyone can share what they know and ask questions about what they don't know. Uh, please be welcoming and kind to everyone. And so that's kind of like the three basic parts of our workshop is being inclusive, collaborative, and kind. So next slide, please. So today we're gonna to be talking about gardening and we're going to split it into two sections, indoor gardening and outdoor gardening. Um, and the first question is why do we garden and why should we garden? And why does that help reduce food waste? So. There are a couple of reasons why gardening reduces food waste and why it's good for you. Um, and you guys are feel free to put in the chat uh, what your ideas are about why gardening is important to you. Um, 
But one of the reasons why gardening is so important is it brings the community together. So whether you have a community garden um, or if you have your own garden and you have a lot of um, vegetables that you harvest and you share them with your neighbors or even if your neighbors come by and they ask, oh, how do you grow this? It sort of builds that dialogue with uh, your community. And it also enables you to share what you harvest with others and uh, be grateful for the food that you have because um, you've grown it yourself. And another sort of um, a benefit from gardening is that you know exactly what is in your food, um, whether they're pesticides or herbicides, or whether or not you don't use them uh, as well, um, you know exactly what's in your food and it makes you feel more reassured about what you're eating and whether or not it's healthy for you. So that's also why gardening is um, really important as well. And another thing is that you can be really creative with your garden, right? You can choose what to garden. Um, you can make it look really pretty. You can grow lots of flowers <laughs> um, and it also helps to create your own little ecosystem in your own backyard, right? So if you have all these bees and you have snakes and then you have all this wildlife that comes by to your garden, it also helps, um, you know, the, the whole environment and um, increase populations of say wild bees that don't have um, the flowers uh, that they usually get access to. They can go to your garden if you have flowers for them. Um, it's also much cheaper because you don't have to go to the grocery store, so you save on time and gas as well. Um, so that's also a huge benefit of gardening. And of course, you make really good memories. So if you ever grow anything yourself, like carrots, they look very different from what is from the grocery store. They look all deformed and really weird. <laughs> so it's always nice to take pictures of what you grow and to have some memories from that. So that's also why gardening is pretty cool as well. Um, and uh, next slide is we're gonna talk about indoor gardening. Um, and there's three ways you can sort of start your own indoor gardening. I'm by no means an expert. So if any of you do indoor garden and you have any input, please feel free to put in the chat. Um, but there's three ways. So one is you can grow um, your food from scraps that you find in the grocery store. And we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences doing that. Uh, which is really awesome because um, you don't waste any of the food scraps and you can actually use it to grow your own food, which is pretty cool. And then another is that you can actually grow from seed. Uh, you can germinate inside indoors and you can actually grow food indoors. Um, indoor gardening is really great for people who live in apartments or who don't have uh, the luxury of having a huge backyard um, or access to a community garden. So you can grow, um, you can germinate them in soil. So you can see here, you can use like an egg curtain. And also the eggshells are really good because once they break down, it releases calcium and nitrogen as well, which is good for the plant as it grows. And then third is, I'm not sure if any of you guys heard of it, but it's called hydroponics. So it's basically using water and some nutrients um, rather than soil to grow plants. And you can totally do that indoors and it's not very messy, <laughs> which is nice. So next we're gonna talk about our different experiences growing vegetables from the grocery store. All the scraps that you get, you can actually regrow them. Um, but first, um, Shauna's gonna go over the indoor kit setup. Um, some of you might've received this uh, a few days ago. So she's gonna go over how to set it up. Mm -hmm. So actually today, um, yeah, we're very glad that so many of you registered from Prince George and we were very excited to get you all your gardening kits as well. Um, we had a lot of fun putting them together and everything, so we hope you enjoy them as well. Um, unfortunately, Helga, our fourth team member, was supposed to be the one actually walking through the kit setup. They're the one who actually has our demonstration kit, um, but they had to be with their family today and weren't actually able to make it in the end. Uh, so in place of that, we're gonna still walk through a bunch of other stuff related to indoor gardening. And as Anne mentioned, our experiences with scraps. And in place of this indoor gardening kit set for all, all of you that receive that, we will be trying to put together a video that we will also send out to everyone. Um, so you still get a tutorial and walkthrough of setting up that kit. And if you ever have any questions when it comes to setting up your kit or when it comes to growing in them um, that pop up as you go along, 
um, you can always reach out to us um, through email or our social media, which we'll put in the chat as well at the end of our meeting today. Um, but yeah, apologies for that last minute change. Um, it was a short notice piece for us as well, but we still look forward to sharing lots of information with you. So yeah, I'll pass that back to Anne for scraps. Thanks, Shauna. All right. So I'm going to be talking about Celery Root. I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen this in the store or not, um, but it's like this ugly looking <laughs> root, but actually tastes really good. <laughs> um, what you do is you can use it in soups and stuff. You can cut it out, put it in soups, and it, it makes your soup so flavorful. Um, and uh, once you use the root, what you can do is you can cut off the top. So the top over here, um, and then you can just put it in a shallow bowl of water, uh, leave it in the sun by your windowsill, and it'll start to have these leaves grow out of it. And then also roots. And then at that point, you can put it in the soil. I haven't done this, actually. I haven't actually put it in the soil because where I live, there isn't like a huge backyard. So uh, what you can do is you could just leave it out on your windowsill and you can just collect all the leaves that grow from it and just eat it. <laughs> um, and I must say that celery root, I thought it had a relation to celery, but they're actually two different vegetables. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how you can actually grow uh, celery from your scraps as well. So the only difference between celery and celery root is for celery root, you cut the top, right? And you put in a shallow bowl of water and then you leave it. But for celery, you actually cut the bottom and you put it in water. So not the top, but the bottom. Um, and it's basically pretty similar. You just put it in water and face uh, facing the sun, and then um, it should grow some leaves and some stalks, and then some roots as well. And then you can just place it um, in the soil in late spring and, or summer in full sun, water it regularly, and you should be able to harvest it. I haven't done this. So uh, any testimonials out there who actually put it in soil and grew it in the soil afterwards, uh, please let us know in the chat or you can just unmute yourselves, let us know how you did it. But um, I haven't personally done that before. So uh, yeah, and then next, I think uh, Hannah or Shauna will talk about green onions. <laughs> yeah, so this one's me. So green onions are a pretty easy one to do growing from scraps. Um, also with this one, I I'd be surprised to hear if nobody on our call today has done this one. So we'd love to hear your experiences with that. Um, any, would anybody like to share their experiences aloud right now about with green onions, celery or celery root? Well, I see Leanne here My in the chat. My friend does the green oh. onion one a lot, um, awesome. especially like throughout the pandemic. Um, I think she has a couple of jars on her windowsill. Awesome, that's very exciting, yeah. Thanks, Judy. And this is mine from uh, from the pot. I planted it about three weeks ago and is growing quite well in the pot. Awesome, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Gwen. You're welcome. Awesome. Yeah, so there's a few folks on the call here who've seen this firsthand, but on the slide you'll see for uh, green onions are pretty simple. So once you kind of use up your green onion, leave about uh, an inch or so of the white part and the bulb and the roots at the bottom. Um, place them in a little small dish, a jar, a cup, whatever you have available to you. Um, that keeps them standing upright. And then you add water to the dish and leave about half an inch of the white still above water. So leaving that space still um, and set it in a sunny place. Change the water out every few days. And um, after about a week or so, um, you'll really see these sprouting up like in the third image here and after you have that a few inches of growth you can begin cutting it um, and using as much or as little of it as you'd like so you can cut it right back down to that first inch and it will still continue to grow um, when you're growing them in water uh, you might get around five grows out of them um, but it depends on a lot of different things i suppose and how lucky you are with it um, it could be more it could be less depending on how you're doing it also with green onions, similar to celery, you can plant this as well. You can actually get longer growth then out of them. So if you plant them in soil and again, stick them on your windowsill, put them in a cup with some uh, nice soil, then 
you can really grow these all year round um, from the same roots. So yeah, they're a really easy one, really awesome to do. Um, and also I see here in the chat, great comment from Margaret that uh, she had a couple of green onions in soil and they lasted about a year, which is pretty awesome. So imagine spending a few dollars at the grocery store to get a few stalks of green onions, plant them and you've got green onions for a year. Um, so really, really awesome piece there. And with that, I will pass it over to Hannah for our next scrap. So I focus on romaine lettuce and these are my pictures of the lettuce that I grew. Um, contrary to what Anne and Shauna were talking about, you cannot <laughs> replant romaine lettuce, unfortunately, but I think it's a good way to kind of extend the life of your food scraps just a little bit. So when you've used all the leaves that are part of the romaine lettuce, you can leave about an inch or so of the stem and place it in water. And then you leave it in the sun and within like a week and a half, it'll probably regrow to the biggest that it will be. And so it won't be a lot. It won't be the same size as when you bought the lettuce. Um, but you can, you might be able to grow enough for a small salad or to put in a sandwich. And um, it's a good way to extend the life, even if it's not as to the extent as some other uh, vegetables that you can regrow. Um, there is the possibility of you waiting too long and thinking, oh, maybe it'll grow bigger if I keep waiting, but it can turn blue and grow bitter as it starts to try and kind of seed and regrow as a and germinating plant and then you really can't eat it, it will not taste good. And fun fact, if your water turns like green or blue or red or something, that is means it was grown in hydroponics and that's kind of the dye that they use to see uh, the nutrients going to the plants. It's a fun thing that I like <laughs> and because uh, I was wondering why my water is green. Um, yeah, so it's a fun way to extend it, but it's definitely not something that will last for a year. Yeah, so Judy has also experienced that. And then our last uh, regrowing thing that we're going to talk about is potatoes. Um, so I'm sure that everyone's probably bought potatoes and left them a little bit too long and they start growing what they're called eyes or these stems out of them. Um, so if you do get that, you can plant them in a large bucket of soil and they will start to regrow. And you can also cut the potato into pieces with those eyes and get many potato plants or potato uh, regrowths. And there's two methods for growing sweet potatoes from the store. So you can place them on a covered bed of moist soil and then put a thin layer of soil over them as they sprout or uh, if it's a small potato, you can kind of suspend it in a jar of water using toothpicks and place it in a well lit area and it'll sprout. Um, also, you should take note that store bought potatoes can sometimes take longer to produce eyes, but if it's stored in a warm, dark environment like your pantry, um, they eventually will. And at this point, they can be planted like regular seed potatoes. Uh, just to make sure that to hill them and mound soil around them as they grow so you can maximize your yield. So lots of soil means lots of potatoes. And then I think we'll go next to Anne's piece on foraging. Thanks, Anna. Um, so before we go to the foraging part, um, does anybody have anything they want to share? Maybe some other vegetables that they've grown from scrap that was not mentioned here? Let us know in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. When we were little, we attempted to save all the watermelon seeds and throw them into the backyard and like bury them in soil, but nothing ever grew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish like you could just throw seeds and then it'll just grow. <laughs> I've done that with lemons too. <laughs> And it didn't work. <laughs> Has anybody tried avocados before? Avocado seeds? No? They take way too long. I attempted it. It didn't work out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My thought exactly. Jerusalem artichoke, Gwen says. 
That's cool. Will there be a replay of this available? Yes. So all of our recordings are um, uploaded to uh, YouTube, and then we will share the link with you after the workshop. Really? Oh. For the avocado, I did see on um, one of the talk shows, uh, Drew Barrymore show, I think, they said that you have to scrape the outside of this the avocado seed. Like you have to scrape that part off first, which I didn't do mm. um, before you attempt to like regrow it. Interesting. Maybe that's where I screwed up. <laughs> I, I will yeah. say that I've scraped it and it does grow, but uh, similar to uh, Gwen in the chat, or, and similar as Belinda as well. I, you, I don't know if we can actually get fruit from them from just putting the seed mines in water. It makes for a really pretty plant and it's fun to watch it grow. Um, but yeah, I'm not, not sure about actually getting the avocados from them. <laughs> okay, cool. Oh, there you go. Is that the avocado, Gwen? Oh, you're, you're muted. This is my avocado in a little pot. And I cannot so remember how many months it has been in there. And I didn't, I tried the one where you put the toothpick and it didn't work. So I just put <laughs> avocado seeds in this, two seeds are in this little pot and it grew. And wow. now I'm trying out with five other seeds. So... Actually, yeah. I That's eat so avocado for the seeds to grow. <laughs> wow, so you just put the seed in the soil and it just grew yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. The ones that I put in the, uh, awesome. with the toothpicks and all that, they all died. But strangely, this one survived. And now I'm putting ginger, um, organic ginger, as well as lemongrass and my lemongrass is growing actually very well. This is my lemongrass. After, oh, wow. after three weeks, it grew. Um, so tall. Lemongrass is very expensive, so I thought I'll grow, mm -hmm. I'll grow them, and I just put them in the pot. And for this one, I had um, a, a grow light. The grow light I bought from the dollar store for $4, and I put this under the grow light, and then it started... Um, growing leaves and now it's outside so oh, um, wow. I think my turmeric is also growing quite well that's amazing Gwen wow yeah. <laughs> so you just and, got them from the I'm grocery so store and put them Some... in the soil sorry oh uh, you just uh, buy them from the grocery store and then just put in the soil yes or... yes, oh, yes okay yes. no uh, for for this one I put them in the for these I put in the pot um mm. Um, about uh, half an hour ago, I put ginger in the soil. I just put ginger in the soil just to see whether oh. it's going to grow. But I think I have ginger somewhere, but uh, I'll look and uh, I'll show you how it looks like, ginger in a pot. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gwen, for sharing. You're welcome. <laughs> Wow, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> There's so many things you can grow. <laughs> so exciting. Okay, so um, we're gonna move on to foraging, but if you have anything else to share, please do so in the chat. Um, I'm just gonna go briefly over different things that I've personally foraged for. Um, I'm by no means an expert. <laughs> so just a disclaimer, don't take everything I say and um, just go out to the forest and just pick stuff. Um, <laughs> I will tell you some foraging tips after this, but uh, these are the ones that I've personally picked and I've eaten and I am alive. So <laughs> uh, you can count on these being okay to eat maybe. Um, so some of you might recognize what these are. So um, if you do, just put in the chat like what they are, um, but I'll just go from the top left picture and I'll go around uh, clockwise. So the top left, I'm pretty sure all of you guys have heard of this, but they're fiddleheads. <laughs> um, and I think the season is over now, um, but 
like three weeks ago or maybe even two weeks ago you can pick them um, and the growing season is pretty short for them so um, once they grow yeah baby ferns <laughs> um, you'll have to pick them when they're actually emerging from the ground a little bit um, if they start to have um, leaves that have sprout out from them then they're not very good to eat so usually you want to eat them when they're like in that sort of fiddlehead configuration just popping out of the ground um, so those are fiddleheads or ostrich ferns. Um, and then on the right, these are fall Solomon seals and um, they grow pretty close to fiddlehead. So if you ever go fiddlehead picking, you might see these next to them or around the area, they sort of grow together. Um, and these uh, you can also pick and all of them, they, it, they're sort of similar in how you can prepare them. Actually, you can just fry them in butter and garlic and some onion and just eat them like that. Um, it tastes a little bit like asparagus. Um, I find the fiddleheads taste a little bit like spinach, but I think it's like a nuttier flavor. Um, and then the one on the far right is fireweed. Um, so those are fireweed shoots. And um, you'll probably see them as you walk popping along. They have some sort of uh, reddish brown leaves that are sort of connected to the stem, like all sprouting out from the stem. So that's how you can recognize them. Um, and then you can do the same thing. You can just take them and fry them in butter. Um, are there any fern species of fiddlehead that you should not eat? Oh, okay. So that's a good question. So oftentimes beside these ostrich ferns, there are other types of ferns that look similar. So these ones, you can see that there's sort of this leathery paper paperish um, thing that is um, attached to it. Um, and it's like one layer only, but there are some ostrich, uh, there are some ferns where um, they have lots of little brown papery things and that's a different species. And they also, are, they look a little lighter than the ostrich ferns. Those ones you can eat. I don't know why people don't really prefer them to these uh, fiddlehead ostrich ferns, but I think it's because they have too many of those brown papery things, so it's pretty hard to wash them later, but you can totally eat them. <laughs> it's fine. Um, I'm not sure about the fiddleheads that you can't eat or the species that you can eat though, so I just know that the ones that you can eat look like this. So if anybody has experience with other types of ferns, please feel free to share in the chat. Um, yeah, so there's a fireweed on the far right, and it tastes a little bit bitter if it grows too much. So you want to harvest them when they're maybe yay high. Um, and yeah, you can just fry them in butter and just eat it like that. It's pretty yummy. Um, and then on the bottom right, uh, these are mushrooms. <laughs> So be very careful with mushrooms because it's very hard to identify them. And please bring an expert when you go out and forage for mushrooms because you don't want to get sick from eating mushrooms. Um, some people have died eating the wrong type of mushrooms, so please don't do that. But I know uh, when I was walking by Ospica, um, and if you go down to Superstore, um, there's a bunch of these mushrooms actually on the side of the road. You probably don't want to harvest them right by the road, but if you harvest them near the forest, then it should be fine. But these are called slippery jacks, or their scientific name is uh, Luteus soilis, I think. Um, I'll put it in the chat later. But um, they're called slippery jacks because they're actually pretty slimy. They have a brown cap. And um, what you can do is you can wash them, and you can basically cut them up and make it into an omelet. Um, so those are pretty yummy. Just make sure that you know for sure that that's the mushroom before you go picking it. Um, I just somehow knew because I had a friend who knew about these mushrooms and he said they're edible. So that's why I trusted him and I, I picked them. Um, but yes, you can totally forage for mushrooms and there's a bunch around Prince George that are edible. And then on the left here beside the mushrooms are um, what is it, stinging nettles? Yes, so you can also find these growing close by to the false Solomon seals and also the fiddleheads. And 
make sure that you wear gloves when you harvest them because they are stinging nettles. So they will sting you and it hurts a lot. So um, just make sure you wear gloves and how you prepare them. You can make them into a syrup, which I've done before, or you can also boil them and eat them just like spinach as well. Um, they're pretty yummy and pretty nutritious. Um, but yeah, make sure that you don't eat them raw because that's not pleasant. <laughs> And then, of course, there's a lot of berries that you can harvest as well. So um, the last picture here is of Saskatoons. So um, Saskatoons are pretty yummy, and you can make them into jam and um, syrups as well. Or you could just eat them from the tree like that. So yeah, just let us know in the chat if you know of any other things that you forage for personally. Um, and yeah, just some foraging tips, of course, is if you don't know, don't pick it. <laughs> it's better to be safe than sorry. So if you see something and you're like, hmm, is that a fiddlehead? And you don't know for sure if it is, just don't pick it <laughs> and, and eat it. Um, or if you want to, you can pick one and just ask somebody, is this a fiddlehead? And then later on, you can go back to that spot and pick more if it is. Um, Make sure that you wash everything before consuming, of course, um, because there's a lot of bacteria or microbes that are probably not good for your tummy. So you wanna wash before consuming and make sure you try a little before eating everything because even though I say it's edible for me, it's edible for me only. So um, make sure you try a little bit of it because some people might have an allergic reaction to um, consuming one or more of those things that I just mentioned. So try a little and then eat more if you can tolerate it. Um, also make sure you go foraging with an expert. Don't go by yourself and forage. Go with an expert, um, somebody you can trust and who's done this many, many times. Um, and also don't pick and destroy everything. So a lot of people, when they hear, oh, fiddleheads, they just go there and pick everything and, and just destroy the whole forest and leave nothing. Um, usually what you want to do is you just want to pick a few and leave behind a couple for, for it to grow back again because you don't want it to die, right? So um, make sure that you don't pick more than, you know, one third of what's there. <laughs> um, usually that's the rule for me personally. Um, and of course, give thanks back to nature um, because, you know, it's, it's not an indef, um, indefinite resource or an unlimited resource. Um, once you pick it, it's gone, right? So um, give thanks to um, the land that you picked it from and also to mother nature for providing sustenance um, and be grateful for the food that you have. And I also see a lot of people as well commercializing uh, many of these things and that sort of contributes to the whole picking and destroying everything. So make sure, you know, you don't support that. <laughs> I mean, I try not to because it means more people will pick it and there will be nothing left. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Leanne. <laughs> okay. So those are the foraging tips. Does anybody have any questions about foraging before we go over to the break or questions about anything we've talked so far in general? I would say be safe and make sure you wash everything before like just consuming things and like you're saying maybe like bring bring somebody with you that's an expert or let people know where you're going before you go just in case something happens oh yeah for sure <laughs> that's a really good tip yes Gwen so you can show your ginger and veg plants we'd love to see them <laughs> okay this is the ginger plant. Can you see? This is the ginger plant. And I just put um, the organic ginger and it started growing. Um, and I'm not sure. I think this is bok choy. Am I right? Is yeah. This bok choy? Mm -hmm. So I ate all the, the leaves outside and I just um, put this in in this little pot. I think this is a three inch pot, and and I do not want to take it out because the roots will will get torn, 
And I also have this. I do not know whether this is also bok choy. I ate mm -hmm. all the outside and put and put this in the ground and it started. And I think it's growing very well because yeah, after awesome. two weeks, it, it did nothing died, nothing dried up. So, and this is actually outside in the sun right now. So that's amazing. And, and I think these are the potatoes you were talking about. <laughs> it's growing. I've, oh, got, yeah. I've got another eight or eight other potatoes, but the thing is, I don't have enough pots and I don't have <laughs> enough land. I just don't have the land to grow. And I wish I can grow them, but I'll see. I'll, I'll still try to see whether, um, you know, I can grow something out of it, but I already have potato plants in pots. Wow, thank you so much for sharing. You're yeah, welcome. you see, there's so many things that you can grow so easily. Just yeah. put it yeah. in a pot. <laughs> yeah. Even in the end, if you don't eat them, it's, mm -hmm. it's the uh, excitement, the, uh, mm -hmm. the feeling that you, you, you can make something grow it gives you a lot of satisfaction. And especially during times like this, I need that. I just need that to, to feel good, you know? Exactly. And the whole world is, is alive to me. Yeah, I mean, if you fill your whole room with all the greenery, oh, it's, it's so uplifting when you go into that room. Exactly, <laughs> yes. exactly. So now, now that I don't have space to plant, maybe I'll, I'll put it, um, near the window inside the house and hope mm -hmm. it grows yeah oh my yeah. god that's so cool but thank you so you, much for sharing i mm -hmm. every every time when i see it grow uh, i will touch it and and you know it just i mean i don't sing <laughs> i don't <laughs> sing to my plants but i will touch it and <laughs> and i think the plants sort of sense that you are happy and they just mm -hmm. grow happily for you I think. Yeah, exactly. Well, they're living beings, right? So <laughs> I think so. I, yes. I mean, to me, that's how I feel, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. And it's oh, totally okay to sing to your plants too. I think they'll like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a good voice and I'm scared they might, they might not grow up. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Gwen, again, for You're sharing. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, cool. So now I think it's time to have our break before we have um, our session on outdoor gardening with a very special guest, Dave Rempel from the D uh, David Douglas Botanical Society. Um, so we're just going to take a five minute break. Um, feel free to um, keep writing in the chat or show each other um, other plants that you've grown in the meantime as well. Um, but this is a chance for you to just take a quick bathroom break. We'll be back at um, or uh, sorry, three <laughs> forty three. See you guys soon. So, oh, should we try loading up here in a minute or? Yeah, sure. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Okay. So, all right. So now let's see. So if I go share screen. Mm -hmm. Is it there? You're muted, Anne. Oh, oops, yes, I see it, Dave. Is it there? Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right. Should I leave it like this or, or go, to, uh, go to slideshow already? I can leave it like this till you're ready or? Um, I think you can go straight to the slideshow, Dave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So slideshow and from the beginning. Uh, 
that look okay? Perfect. Okay. Okay, is everyone back yet? Oh. We're going to start very soon. Okay, great. So I'm just going to introduce um, our guest speaker, Dave, um, from the David Douglas Botanical Society. Um, so thank you so much, Dave, for presenting on outdoor gardening. Um, it's a really, really cool and important topic here in Prince George. Um, so Dave is basically um, has been a resident of PG um, since uh, 1983, <laughs> where you bought your first acre of land and put your first row of potatoes. Um, and then now that row of potatoes has turned into 2,000 square feet of vegetables, a dozen fruit trees, several rows of raspberries, strawberries, currants, everything that you can name basically. So Dave has a ton of experience growing outdoors. Um, and uh, he also took the Master Gardener basic training program offered in Prince George in 2008. And he's been a Master Gardener ever since. Um, and he also helped organize Prince George's 100 foot diet gardening seminar for about a dozen years. So Thank you so much, Dave, again, for uh, being our guest speaker today and uh, take it away. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, very interesting to hear your 
earlier presentations here. I'm not very experienced at all with growing food inside, um, but I do very much enjoy uh, growing food outside. And uh, I've been privileged to have this little piece of, of land for all these years. Um, and uh, I was thinking about all the benefits that, uh, and that you mentioned earlier uh, for, uh, for gardening and uh, flavor is another one and nutrition perhaps and uh, definitely does uh, does save uh, money but there's always a trade-off uh, someone once said it could be either uh, it's money or uh, money or time uh, often so it takes a while to develop a, a garden um, so looking out the uh, back window of Upstairs of our house. That's my play area here. I'm sorry about that uh, little message on top of the screen there. I'm not sure how to get rid of it. It goes in and out. But uh, anyways, uh, so like was mentioned when I first began, I, I, it was a very thin layer of a little bit of black soil, perhaps over clay and rock and. Uh, uh, like, like was mentioned, and now I've ended up over these years, 35 years or so, with with uh, relatively decent garden soil, I think. Um, so uh, I do my gardening for more or less in ground, in ground gardening. On the left, you see some raspberry rows. In the back are a couple of the trees, apple trees, and there's more on a, on another little bit of the property. Uh, Besides the benefits that were mentioned earlier, looking at this, I have two other benefits. One, I got all my exercise that I need. I saved money on, on gym memberships or whatever. And, it's, <laughs> and the other one, those of you that uh, maybe have uh, jobs that uh, stress you out a bit, or even if you enjoy them, you come home kind of like frazzled. I find uh, gardening, going in, turning over some soil or whatever, very, uh, therapeutic and relaxing. And so that has been, been a real benefit to me as well. Uh, this piece of property is close to, close to Tabor Lake, um, not at the lake, but uh, so I'm a, a couple of levels higher, I'm a little bit higher than the airport. So what you can grow in, uh, in Prince George in the bowl, I cannot always grow or it freezes earlier and thaws later here, but there's still quite a lot that, uh, that you can grow. So I thought I'd start with uh, some perennials. You probably recognize some of these. Uh, the rhubarb coming out of the snow on the top left. The advantage of perennials is you don't have to buy plants every year and you don't have to buy seeds. So if you can provide some of your nutrition from perennials, that's a real benefit. Um, then you probably all recognize the chives. Um, one of the first green things you can toss into salads or whatever else you like to toss them onto in, uh, in the kitchen. On the bottom right, I don't know if anybody recognizes that. That's the, the top of what's called um, Egyptian onions or walking onions. They just come up every year and it's not even in a very good part of the, so of the garden, but they do well there. So at first, it's like like onion tops. Uh, you can eat them like like onion tops, like greens uh, we've already had for several weeks already. And then after a while, they grow larger and uh, maybe not quite so edible anymore. And they grow these bulb bills on top, um, and then from which they grow up again. Those bulb bills are easy to plant if you want more, and uh, if you're willing to fiddle with them and peel them, they. Uh, is sort of like a mild garlic uh, flavor or taste, sort of uh, onion garlic or whatever. The bottom left is, uh, I don't actually use it for food. That's, um, uh, let me think again. Uh, right, borage, 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 I'm saying that correctly. So it's great for bees and uh, um, the thing is, uh, don't uh, be careful where you plant it because uh, if you dig part of it out and want to try to get rid of it, it'll 
grow again and it grows from all the little rootlets you leave. So like mint, you want to kind of be careful. Uh, otherwise, it'll spread around on you. Um, here, um, so uh, asparagus. Now, that's a long term kind of project for years. My wife wanted me to put in an asparagus bed and I didn't get to it for a while, but eventually I did. And, and they, once you have a, a lot, you know, enough organic matter, you get the, the roots in deep enough. Uh, the first year or two, you don't eat from it. You let the fronds grow on top that you see on the left. Some of them will be male, some of them will be female. And after about by the third year or so, you start eating the fattest ones that come up. And once they get like as thin as a pencil, then you leave them. The tops grow again, and that supplies the energy for the roots um, for next year. Right now, we've we've had several nice feeds of asparagus already this spring, and I noticed some more coming. And they're, you know, some of them are honestly they're as thick as a, your thumb coming up out of the ground. And uh, it's so nice to be able to have this treat and not have to think about it being transported thousands of kilometers to get to you. And I know that I haven't put anything mm -hmm. except my compost on there, um, so uh, nothing nothing sprayed. Uh, around it, you'll see uh, parsley just to use up the space. So uh, parsley isn't perennial, but it's a herb. And so now we can look at a few herbs that you can grow. I don't grow that many. Uh, dill, because we like dill pickles. So I try to grow some dill every year. It grows very easily. And I know some people just let it, some of it go to seed on top and uh, it comes up wherever in the garden by itself. So that's an easy one to, to grow. Uh, the one thing you might find is uh, these sometimes aphids. It's an aphid attractor. So don't do what I did. I gifted my mother-in-law with a nice uh, bag of lettuce and then I quickly cut some dill and stuffed it in there like a grocery bag full or a bread bag full and gave it to her and she chided me later about opening it up in her kitchen sink and having to deal with a whole bunch of the aphids that came out of there. But anyways, uh, they don't do, seem to do too much damage to the, the, the dill itself. So for your salads, lettuce and radishes, together with those onion tops you were growing before, um, all really easy to grow. The only thing is for radishes, they don't really care for the heat too much and the long days in summer. So right now I have radish, lettuce and spinach coming up and uh, they usually do quite well for a few weeks in spring. And then uh, not every year, but some year I've managed to replant again in say later August and I harvested all the way to Thanksgiving with a little bit of cover over them. And that's what you see here, actually, those radishes that I grew that fall, I think they were better than the spring ones. And it was kind of nice, a nice treat to have again. Uh, so here's just a few, uh, few names of um, varieties that I've, I've grown. I mean, if you, if you buy, you know, if you go to the nursery because you're not, you don't buy the seeds, then you don't have much choice. But on seed racks, there's usually a lot of choice. And towards the end, uh, or at the end of the slides, I'll have uh, some references where you can, some seed catalogs or where you can go for information if you want to try different varieties. Leaf, leaf lettuces seems like the easiest to grow. And there's dozens and dozens of varieties. This is just some that I've grown. Uh, the ones that are more, I think, called butterheads, uh, they're, they're not bad too. They take a little bit longer to grow, uh, for me anyways. Um, the tennis ball and the Tom Thump, they're smaller. So, uh, you know, you can, if you have a number of them, even growing in pots, you can just cut one for, for lunch or for a salad for even for yourself and you're not left with leftovers for the fridge or whatever. Kind of nice to have the small ones. Uh, what you don't see here is the romaine or cos or the, the head lettuce. I have grown it too, but it takes 
quite a bit longer to grow. And sometimes if the summer gets hot and dry, then it's a little harder to get some nice tasty lettuce from there. Other years, it goes good. Radishes, this, the, oops, I'm sorry. These first ones, French breakfast is more like your, uh, like uh, looks more like a cylinder with a little bit pointed at the end, but there's a whole variety of Cherry Bell, Rudolph, Champion, and others that are red on red, red pinkish on the outside and nice white on the inside. If you want to try something different, German Giant is much larger, it takes a long time, longer time. And if you have trouble with the little, little worms, the little larva that, uh, that can get into your, your radishes, then maybe you don't want to, to do them. If I plant early in spring, and then later in fall, I kind of miss, I, like I don't have trouble usually with, if, the, if they start to get worming, then I just pull them all out and plant some more later. Uh, plum purple I grow because it's a, well, it's an open pollinated variety, which are many, many of the others are also open pollinated. And, but I have, I don't know, that one bolts easier, it seems, but I kind of like uh, to see all the different colors on a plate. So having a purple on the outside together with the red and the light pink and the other others, the white icicle is a, is a white actually. Then there's others called watermelon and so on that are interesting. Spinach, you have to put in pretty early uh, because it as soon as the days get longer or and uh, it gets hotter, it wants to bolt and go to seed and then and then you might as well pull it out and put it in your compost. So these are some varieties that I've grown. I think I should maybe speed up a bit here. You can grow lettuce in, in pots too. Uh, I think the one on the right is in sort of like a flower box container of some kind. Yep. And in the left uh, one here, it got carried away and made up a whole bunch of pots with lettuce in them. It's nice just to go step out your back door and it's clean, there's no dirt on them. And uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of a nice way. Uh, onions can be easy to grow. Uh, you can buy onion sets, which are the easiest, but you don't have much choice for variety. Uh, the onions you see here, I grew from seed, but it, that's a quite a bit of work in a sense, or it takes time. So I started them in March and I grew them in a house under lights at first. And once it gets, warm enough, then I put them out on the deck and and they take a long time to get, and then they, you, you transplant them and uh, then you can get quite nice big ones. Carrots, the main problem I have with carrots because I have such clay soil is germination. Uh, but once they're germinated and if I uh, restrain myself and don't try to seed too sickly, then not have to thin so much, you can get pretty decent carrots. I had lots of trouble with carrots for quite a few years. Now the main problem I have is the carrot rust fly and it, it lays its eggs close to the carrot and then, and then the larva that has drill holes through tunnels through the carrots. And so one way to um, avoid that is to put like a floating row cover over top or uh, even put sides around the bed that you're growing your carrots in or around the row, like uh, something like chloroplast or some, something that's 18 inches high. Apparently the fly doesn't fly higher than 18 inches. Um, so I try to go two feet anyways. And uh, that seems to get rid of or avoid most of the, the carrots. So if you do have trouble with the carrot rust fly, uh, one one variety is called flyaway. That seems to be resistant. And as far as I can tell, it, tell, it still tastes good. Tastes like a good carrot. Uh, Bolero and Amsterdam, they keep pretty good, pretty well for me in the cellar, in the cold room. And then uh, Nantes varieties of various kinds. Um, the more blunt shaped ones, because I don't have very deep soil. So I, I don't grow the, the typical very long uh, cone-shaped pointy ones that the burr rabbit likes because uh, my soil isn't actually deep enough. I have 
clay and hard pan further down. So, and the, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it, it right, the Chantenay carrots, they're more broad shouldered, they're tapered, but they don't go so deep. So, uh, yeah. Beets, beets, uh, I find pretty easy to grow most years. Um, some years, I don't know exactly why it doesn't grow so well. It might be the soil, but beets and shards grow well. Um, some names of varieties have grown across the top there. Um, red Detroit, dark red is a, a very common traditional grown for decades and the others are all pretty good too. If you are in the habit of wanting to grow some, if you have a way to store uh, in your room, a colder, a cooler place in where you live, then a winter keeper or Lutz green leaf is the other name for it. Um, it. What I like about it, you can just harvest it in fall, clean it up a little bit and stick it in a bucket. And yeah, you don't have to hardly do anything. And it, it keeps for months there. And uh, Cylindra and Tanis, Tanis they're both like, uh, like the yeah, cylindrical carrots, and they can grow. Uh, sorry, uh, beets. They can they can grow up to, like I don't know, four inches, three four centimeters in diameter and long, and uh, really nice for processing and or just preparing for supper. The the yellow ones, uh, burpees golden, and you can't see the name of the other ones. Tushan gold. Uh, they're a little trickier, it seems to me. They look so nice on the table if you. If you can uh, prepare them separately from the red ones, they have, that makes such a beautiful dish, the red and the, the yellow beets on a plate. Uh, or if you if you can them or pickle them, they're just so attractive. But I find they're a little harder to germinate, at least I find it that way. And they're not as vigorous growing, at least not for me. And uh, if you like Swiss char for the, the tops, grows fairly well and easily I find uh, Fort Hook Giant is probably, it's a green one, green stem one. It, it grows the largest. Uh, rainbow or orange, rainbow is all the different colors. It's nice, red, pink, orange, yellow, pale, pale green, green. And orange Fantasia is the one that you see there. The stalks range from, um, from orange to yellow, but basically they all taste the same. Um, Brassicas um, depends. Some are easy, some take a little bit more work. I don't know if you recognize the one on the right there, Rutabaga. Uh, no, sorry, that's in the ground. Kohlrabi, my fault. Kohlrabi is fairly easy to grow and you can, you can steam it, you can use it in soup, some people do. You can slice it up and, and as a dip or whatever and eat it, uh, eat it raw as finger food. It's great. Um, cabbages of all kinds, if you're prepared to uh, maybe cover them up with a light floating, uh, floating row cover when the little white moth is fluttering around your garden so it doesn't lay the, the eggs that hatch into the little green worms that hide in there or chew at your, uh, chew at your leaves. And some years slugs are a trouble, not every year, but last year was pretty bad. I spent a lot of time slug picking actually. Uh, broccoli is uh, reasonably easy to grow, various kinds. Cauliflower is the trickiest, it seems to me. Um, it depends on the summer. Some years it can be good. Other years, if it gets hot quickly, broccoli, cauliflower doesn't like that very much. And it'll button, that means it'll make a tiny little head and then that's it. And maybe want to go to seed after that. Cauliflower likes long stretches of moderately cool weather, not you know, like a coolish summer kind of thing. Uh, so there are some names of kinds. Since this is recorded, I won't say too much about, except down at the bottom there, I hope you can see it where it says kohlrabi. Uh, I, I don't grow the, 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 uh, the common ones that, uh, that you'll see are purple, what, white uh, Vienna or purple Vienna. Sorry, the word Vienna seems to be missing off the screen. 
Uh, to me, they by the time they get hardly bigger than a tennis ball, they end up getting kind of fibrous. Whereas super smelts, if you can find that variety, uh, I've seen pictures of as, as big as a, a volleyball, uh, but I, I don't grow them that big. But I have grown them as big as say a, a five pin bowling ball, no, a 10 pin bowling ball. And they're, except for the, the root end, which can be a bit tough that you cut off, the rest of it is all good all the way through. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And Cossack and Colibre are good too. Uh, you notice that I didn't put uh, uh, kale on here. Uh, that's because I'm not used to growing kale, although it grows well and there's lots of good nutrition in that one. And another one that I didn't put on is Brussels sprouts. I grow it some years, but that's also a long-term project. It takes like, from the time you put it in the garden, most varieties take like 120 days or something before it's ready. So that's like four months worth. So yeah, you have to have a long-term commitment for Brussels sprouts. But if you do it and you pick it after a few light frosts, you probably might not want to buy the ones in the store anymore. That's the trouble with growing your own is that the ones in the store often don't taste quite so good anymore. I was gonna say about the carrots, quickly one story. Uh, I brought in a bowl of carrots of, of small ones that I didn't wanna deal with to a grade eight or nine math class when I was teaching. And the kids all kind of rolled their eyes at me because you know the English teacher next door brought gummy bears. When, but um, anyways, uh, after the lesson and while they were doing their homework, uh, one of the kids just marched up and grabbed one. I said, here, help yourself with brain food. And uh, she took a bite and said, these are good. And before I knew it, I, you know, I was helping somebody with a math question. I turned around and they were all gone. And at the end of the period, somebody gingerly put up their hand and said, Mr. Rimple, you should do this more often. I guess they had never tasted real carrots. All they had, had tasted was the grinder carrots, you know, those little lunch pack things that people put in their kids' lunch. Anyways, if you like um, these, these are for the biggest. They grow easily, you can seed them. It's a little hard to seed because the seeds are so small, but storage is a piece of cake. And you just like clean them up a bit and put them in a, in a bucket or whatever in your cold room if you have one and, or, if you have a, uh, they're a little large to keep in your fridge. There's probably other things you want to keep in your fridge, but uh, yeah, they just uh, it, they just last a long time. You can put them in with your mashed potatoes. You can eat them raw many different ways. Potatoes were mentioned before. Um, I I because I have developed the room over time. I have enough potatoes to to last our family through the winter. So I haven't bought potatoes for probably decades or uh, I, I save the seed and then, then I use them again. And so one impetus for continuing to do this was when our son was young, um, we found he had kind of a reaction to store-bought potatoes. He went lethargic on us when he was just, just eating, starting to eat um, real food. And when I switched back to organic food, potatoes because we'd run out of our own, that went away. So we're not sure what that was, maybe what they spray them for, or so they don't sprout in the store, or you know, maybe if you know, but if, a whole, if you see a whole potato field that all is brown at the same time when they're harvesting it, they've, they've sprayed it with Roundup to kill the tops. So if you do that year after year in the field, I'm not sure what it does to the potato. Garlic, so maybe a decade or so ago, I. I tried earlier, didn't work too well. Now I wonder why not everybody grows garlic. Like why buy garlic from offshore when it grows so easily here? Um, and it, yeah, um, we love our garlic. We grow enough now to supply our own needs and friends like it even for Christmas gifts. It's once you dry them, I just put them in paper bags or in, in, in a cardboard box in the basement and yeah, they, I mean, we're eating the last ones now. I told the family I've, I've only got like 10 bulbs left. So that's 10 weeks. So maybe my next crop for this year should be ready. Uh, peas uh, are traditionally very easy to grow here. 
one year I made the mistake, maybe, I don't know if it's a mistake of growing one called tall telephone. That's what you see growing on the left. It's quite a few years ago and my parents were still alive, but uh, my, they were impressed that their son was able to grow peas that grew that tall. So maybe unless you're willing to put up a, a, a trellis or something, don't grow tall telephone. There's uh, many others that grow well, uh, you know, to waist or shoulder height. You'll still want to put them up, grow on something because if they just fall on the ground, then when it gets wet, then they get moldy and slugs are accessible to them. And so it's better for them to be up. Beans. Uh, Beans, of course, are a hot weather plant, as you see in the, in the box in front here, but uh, they're, those are bush beans. Um, I have them some, in, a, in a raised bed uh, so that I can cover them in spring and in fall, but if, if the weather gets cool, uh, the disadvantage is that there's not much airflow down there. And if it gets damp down in there, then sometimes I have trouble with it with mold starting in there. But uh, they're good. And some bush beans, what I look for are the kinds that um, say um, have the shortest days to harvest. Uh, they're usually ones that will be successful. And the ones I have listed here, most of them, you pick them when they're like pencil, pencil thin. And some of these will freeze okay, and others you just want to use for fresh. Pole beans take longer, but they have to get more out of them. Um, purple peacock is nice for stir frying and for eating fresh. It, it's easy to pick because it's purple, but then, uh, uh, yeah, it, it turns green when you steam it or whatever, but they don't freeze well, I found. When you thaw them, they turn mushy, whereas the other ones listed there, uh, they, they're good for freezing or canning as well, if you like to do that. Dry beans, I tried for the first time last year. I thought, oh, I'm going to experiment. Well, wrong year, too much rain. I didn't get anything. Slugs ate half of them. So that's a bit of a trick here. So that's my setup in the back there for growing the pole beans. I just, uh, those strings, um, they're actually nylon straps that uh, some, I bought some firewood once uh, or was given to me. I saved the straps and used them year after year after year. Uh, twine is expensive. So gardeners usually make do with what they can find. If you like broad beans, maybe I know if, uh, I don't know if it's typical or not, but I know British, some British people who say, oh, everybody should grow broad beans. It has a beautiful blossom, but you do want to keep it up off the ground. Uh, again, one year I didn't, and yeah, you don't get nearly as much of a good harvest. So they're easy to grow. Cucumbers and zucchini. Um, some years easier than others. Uh, they don't like to be transplanted that well. So you have to be a little bit careful if you buy them at the market, say at the nursery and then harden them off a little bit and then plant them outside. Be a little bit careful with the roots. Uh, so um, a long-term project, if you wanna grow them yourself from seed uh, or um, uh, leeks, but again, easy to keep over the winter for eating by freezing or some years I just got busy around Thanksgiving I dug them out and stuck them in a bucket and they lasted in the bucket till Christmas time with a little bit of roots on them just went down there and ate them so that's good tomatoes uh, you see beans in front but if you don't have a greenhouse and you want to grow tomatoes outside one way you can invest in those uh, they're called cozy coats or water jackets and that's just like a ring of plastic, two rings, uh, like uh, they're tubes of plastic sewn together. They're not for watering their plant, they're thermal, uh, a thermal mass. So during the day, the sun warms up the water and at night the heat releases. And so it keeps the tomatoes inside from freezing. So you can start earlier and well, yeah, that's one way. Uh, and you can, I, I've had mine for 10 years or more. So amortize it over those years. And, it's, it's, and or you can grow them against them, maybe a wall or something like that. I have black plastic back there as a kind of a heat thing. And then that white stuff is a floating row cover. So I toss it over at night and it prevents a, a, a couple of degrees of frost. So um, 
determine it are tomatoes that grow to a certain size and then they produce all their tomatoes more or less at once, but they're smaller. The indeterminate ones, they keep growing. Those are kinds that I've had success with, but there's hundreds of varieties when we get going. Now, just let me just buzz through some fruits. Raspberries are easy to grow, both yellow and, and red, and there's different varieties. The yellow ones, they're milder, but uh, they're not as vigorous around here. Strawberries, if you can keep them from going moldy, they're, they're great. Uh, red currants, white currants, and black currants, uh, the red and white shown here. Uh, if you like that, make jelly, jam, or juice uh, out of them to add to whatever. Uh, gooseberries, um, I've had the same gooseberry plant for over 30 years, two of them. Uh, they just keep producing. Um, on the right is something you might not know, or you might, it's called Josta Berry, J-O-S-T uh, Berry. It's a cross between a black currant and a gooseberry, and it's bigger, it's thornless, and uh, the, the, the little green worm doesn't eat the leaves. Uh, so that's a great one for, it's one of the favorite uh, juice or jam flavors uh, in our family. A new one the last decade is Hascaps or Honeyberry. Um, if you have a space for them, they're great. Uh, cherries, the, yeah, so I'm almost out of time here, but the, the Saskatoon, the, the, the cherries from the University of Saskatoon, the Romance series, uh, they grow as a bush and uh, they, they're awesome. They're not that, they're not that part. And if you have space and time, don't any apples will grow here. And uh, after eating my own apples for all these years, I know it's psychological, but I have a hard time biting into a commercial apple because I know how many times they're paid. So sorry, again, I didn't get the PowerPoint messed up a bit when I transferred computers, but the word that you can't see at the bottom is plant, P-L-A-N-T. Gardening is just another day at the plant. So, and then I'll stop here and whatever time we have left for questions. Um, uh, seeds of diversity, let me highlight that. You go to the Seeds of Diversity website, Maybe go there in winter when you have time and a cup of tea or talk, coffee or whatever you prefer to drink in winter. And you can spend hours exploring different seeds that are available. Seeds of Diversity will list you all the seeds available in Canada and what, uh, which, which um, seed company sells them. So you can get lost there. From the Ground Up is a local person who wrote a book about what you can grow in Prince George. It's mostly landscaping stuff, but it also has fruits, herbs, and vegetables at the back. And if you want to see examples of various fruits, the Railway Museum and the winery, they have, you, you can see what, what some of the, you know, what Hascap looks like if you don't, if you don't know and so on. Anyways, I better stop. Thank you so, so much, Dave. <laughs> whoever's, whoever's taken over. Uh, there seems to be already one question for you uh, from Yingdra Chen. Uh, she asks, um, do you sell your products to the farmer's market? Uh, <laughs> my wife has told me, oh, you can make money. You buy all, you know, make all your seed money. You know what, personally, um, like I do, I don't, I don't, I've never used a rototiller. Everything is done by hand with a spade and a pickaxe originally. And, and so um, I, and I can hardly keep up like uh, keeping it, like it's not neat and tidy, like a, like a, a gardening magazine. If you come over, you got to remember these pictures were taken. These are the best pictures over a number of years. So any one year, it doesn't necessarily look like that. Um, but um, I do what I can, but personally, I just prefer to, uh, give friends gifts of vegetables or people I've, I've given some downtown to a certain organization I've made like uh, applesauce in winter for for a, a new hope downtown and um, I've also grown stuff to give that uh, some of you might have heard of the MCC fall fair that used to be at the Civic Center um, 
I donate vegetables there and it, it raises money for uh, sustainable agriculture in other countries. But I do that instead of trying to sell it. Once you try to sell it, then there's a certain standard. And most of you know that if you, if you eat your own, you don't throw stuff away. If there's a little bruise or something, you cut it out and you eat it, right? If you grow stuff, if you buy stuff from the store, you figure, yeah, you, you, I don't know. That's how I am. I, I, I don't waste anything, hardly, of what I grow. And that's another advantage of growing stuff yourself. There's other good growers at the market. Thank you, Dave. Um, are there any other questions for Dave? Sorry, I took so long. Oh, no, not at all. I wish it was longer. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever are interested in learning more about gardening, but in, in a sort of a broad sense, the Master Gardeners Association, the, the, the local Master Gardeners Association, um, local branch, uh, it's through the David Douglas Botanical and Garden Society, but they um, Every second year, we try to put on a, a gardening course. It includes everything from soils to sort of biology to landscaping, but also to vegetable and fruit gardening. It's a, it's a good course if you can afford it and afford the time. And the, if you want to join the, the David Douglas Botanical and Garden Society, the one benefit for me, even though I'm not that much into the landscape stuff that uh, is up there, I appreciate it, but I, I don't have the the time for it is uh, you most summers for years now they have a, a garden tours in summer every Tuesday evening and you get to go into other people's backyards and see how they garden and you know, every time you learn something it's really neat and you meet a lot of interesting gardeners and it's not very expensive Thanks, Dave. That's a great tip yeah we have a link to the David Douglas Botanical Garden Society um, in a couple of slides. But we have one question for you, Dave, from RB. Um, thank you, Dave. One question, how to prevent animals eating the outdoor grown food? For example, <laughs> bears, birds, tr yeah. trees. <laughs> okay, so so I've had different challenges over time. Like the, the crows used to peck the next ripe apple all the time. I was waiting for the, you know, so I tried Covering with the netting does not work very well, I found. Um, I tried doing those balloon eyes. Nowadays, I don't, for some reason, have so much trouble with crows. Um, moose, I don't know what to do with. They, they come by and they prune my apple trees every early, you know, late winter, it seems. Um, I think if I was around, I'd scare them away if I saw them, but they're pretty early in the morning. I see the tracks. So I just go up after them and kind of, tidy up their pruning later. Uh, bears, um, I, I now have uh, an electric fence that I put around. As soon as I started growing hascap bushes, I had to put the, the fence up in June. <laughs> but in, in the past, I've just put it up, uh, you know, when the apples started to get ripe at the end of August. And it seems to work most years. Some people, I guess, have a dog that might help. Um, I've had trouble with, with field mice eating my beets. I think uh, Phil at the Caribou Grower said what you can do is hill up the soil on the shoulder of the beet so that the, the mice can't, field mice can't get at them. Maybe it helps to have a cat. Um, let's see what else. I haven't had trouble with rabbits, uh, surprisingly, yet. Uh, then there's, there's the little pests like flies that lay eggs that make little larvae that eat your stuff. But people in the organic gardening field, they say, well, can I always count on 10 or 15% going to, you know, to pests and then you'd be happy with the rest. So. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, it's always a bit of a challenge. Yeah, Judy also says squirrels, rabbits, raccoons, and other critters. Oh, uh, here's one for, vegetables. Yeah, uh, for squirrels. Uh, so 
I was at somebody's place and, and here's what they did in, in spring, starting you know, fairly soon now, I guess. They, they took little pebbles about the size of strawberries and paint, painted them a nice red color, nice bright red. And, paint, and, and maybe so, yeah, some of you have seen that. And, and, and it worked that the, the squirrel came to pick them up and after a while got fed up with picking up rocks and left and then um, didn't bother the strawberries anymore. Uh, so the, the rabbits, uh, I don't know, maybe there was a reason for the, you know, your, your typical uh, uh, picket fence around, <laughs> around the country garden from decades and centuries ago, I'm not sure. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, one year I had trouble. I planted um, so onion sets, and they were just up a few inches. And one day I was looking out, and here a crow had landed there, and one by one grabbed the top of the onion set, flicked it over its shoulder, grabbed the next one, flicked it over its shoulder. Well, I went out and chased it away. But then what I did was I took some just some netting, even like even like snow fencing or something, and just laid it over top for a while till the onions were a little bit bigger and then it was okay. So sometimes you have to cover stuff up a little bit at first till it gets going. Awesome tips. And uh Yingdra says, are these random resources all based in BC because I live in Toronto. Oh, so there's a couple of people from the East Coast, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the, if you're from the East Coast, you might uh, know of Essie's. I think they're an East Coast uh, supplier. Uh, what I have here, these uh, baker seeds is from the United States. And the only reason I've got seeds from there is because they have different ones that that I didn't see before and I was interested in trying and because someone in our gardening group was ordering from there anyway. So I just piggybacked on her order. Uh, but, um, and then there's, there's Richter seeds, which I think is in uh, Ontario, which is people go for herbs. TNT is in Manitoba, maybe Brandon or outside of Winnipeg anyway. Uh, William Dam is in Ontario. Um, the, these folks here, they, they don't grow their own seeds. They almost all seed companies that sell seeds, uh, they get them from growers. But these folks, I know I've, I've visited West Coast Seeds in Ladner. They will grow out any varieties that they sell. So if there's some new variety of carrot or kale or whatever, they will do a test first and compare it to the other ones that they have. And if it passes the test, they'll offer it for sale. Whereas some other outfits like McKenzie seeds that you might see in a seed rack, they're basically a warehousing outfit. So they get seeds from wherever and sell, we package them and sell them to you. These ones in the next line here, Prairie Garden Seeds, Terra Edibles, and there's many others. They are like sort of family run or individual run ones, often focusing on one particular thing like Prairie garden seeds focuses a lot on various kinds of bean seeds, for example. I think Terra Edibles has lots of uh, heritage uh, tomato seeds. Uh, they don't have as much information on their packages and so on, but they, they grow their own seeds. And like I said before, I go to the Seeds of Diversity website and on there, you will find every vegetable you can grow in Canada um, and what supplier there there is. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So we're almost running out of time now. Um, so we're just going to wrap up. Uh, thanks again, Dave, for your presentation and for giving all that awesome information. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much again. You're welcome. <laughs> so I'll just I'll just stop share screen. Is that correct? Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Dave. All right. So, Shauna, you want to close? Mm -hmm. So, for today, um, everything that we talked about, we want to wrap up in a few 
interesting resources. So these first ones that you see here are related to COVID-19 and kitchen food waste. So a large part of our initiative has really been focused, in, well, it is all focused on reducing kitchen and food waste. And we've really uh, seen a spike in that during COVID-19 with more people staying at home, ordering food in. Um, so just a few resources there if you're curious to learn more about that. Um, for gardening resources, in addition to the ones that uh, Dave just shared, uh, we also put a few in, specifically one on indoor gardening. So uh, some different vegetables, of, some more in addition to the ones that we have already talked about are in that first link. And all of these resources, along with the ones that Dave shared, we will be sending out in a follow-up email. So don't worry if you don't <laughs> grab it now or anything, um, you'll get them to your inbox. And for the next piece, uh, we do, for each of our workshops, we have prizes. So today's prizes are a mini watering can, gardening gloves, and nasturtium seeds. Um, and we will be picking a winner when I share my screen. Uh, to receive this prize, you do have to be in Western Canada, just so you know. Um, so if you do get picked and you're not located in like Manitoba to BC, uh, then we'll unfortunately have to pick somebody else. So just let us know. So our winner for today of that prize is, Jolly, congrats Jolly. So I, I believe you're located in Prince George, correct? Um, and if that is the case, then I'll email you about getting your address so you get those prizes. Um, for everybody else who attended today who didn't get a prize, um, you're also being entered into our final prize draw, which will conclude at the end of our workshop series at the end of June. And that's going to be a big prize box, including like a composter, more seeds, um, different local items as well. So the more workshops you attend, the more entries you get to that final prize. So be sure to keep tuning in. Um, also, stay in touch. Uh, you can find us on social media or through our email as well. You can contact us. I will put our social media in the chat. We'd love to see your pictures of different things that you're growing, your gardens or uh, your indoor gardening setups, everything that you're growing on uh, social media. So if you're posting that stuff, make sure to tag us. We'd love to see it. And as well for our workshop today, seeing as we are, we do have a few more workshops coming up between now and the end of June. Uh, we would love to get your feedback on what you thought of the workshop today, what, what you liked, maybe what you didn't like so much, your thoughts overall so that we can continue improving these. Um, so yeah, that's all from us today, <laughs> wrapped up in a few short minutes. Apologies for going a couple of minutes over, but I think it was very valuable for all the information that was shared today. So thank you everybody for joining us and we hope to see you at our future workshops as well. And remember for all the links and as well for the recording of this workshop. It'll be in your inbox sometime tomorrow. So thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dave. Okay. <laughs>